Looking at video games nowadays, it's pretty clear that while we're definitely being screwed over in several areas, we're pretty spoiled in one area in particular. For the most part, games look pretty amazing these days. The standard for video game visuals and graphics is so insanely high now that it's expected for most AAA titles to have a level of visual polish to match the gameplay. What used to be pre-rendered cutscenes that didn't match gameplay at all now take place in-engine with transitions that are near seamless. Davy. We even got the custom character in a cutscene meme out of it. The hero of Hyrule. May I ask? Do you really remember me? All of this comes from the desire to give players a cinematic experience. To remove that disconnect from the game's scripted story moments and have players feel like they're more directly involved. One of the more polarizing ways that developers use to attempt to make players feel more engaged in a game's more epic moments are with the quick time event. Absolutely everywhere in the mid-2000s and early 2010s, the QTE was a staple of the end of a boss fight or campaign mission or, if you're this guy, literally every aspect of the game. Every aspect. Jason! 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 Quick time events were, at first, seen as a pretty cool way to enhance the action a little bit. Some of my personal favorite QTEs were in The Force Unleashed, where they would take place at the end of every boss fight and show off the power of Starkiller. In action games like The Force Unleashed and the God of War series, these moments where the player character would absolutely brutalize an enemy are essentially really cool animations that play as a sort of reward for the player. If you struggled with a particularly difficult section, the QTE was never as difficult. You just press the correct input when prompted, and Kratos would do the rest. Pretty quickly, a lot of people got annoyed with these moments, with several valid criticisms being made about their inclusion. Sometimes there's no indication that a QTE is about to begin, so you may fail one by accident. As I said before, most of them really aren't that difficult, so it becomes tedious and repetitive to continually be forced to engage with them. They can grind gameplay to a halt, forcing you to button mash at random moments. The biggest criticism that I've seen levied at quick time events is that, more often than not, they're used to show off a big cinematic moment that the player really has no control of. The game goes into autopilot, taking the reins away from the player and showing them something that, while cool, would have been way cooler if the player had actually done it themselves. However you feel about these moments, I think it's fair to say that we've seen significantly less of them in games now, simply because we've reached such a level of graphical fidelity that there's no reason not to let the players have that epic moment entirely on their own. They came from a desire to show the player something that they couldn't do yet, to make the game feel more like a film. However you may feel about that concept, we've reached that level of detail now, but we wouldn't be here without those games that took a massive leap forward, trying something totally new. In this video, I want to take a look back at a video game that was unlike anything ever seen before at the time of its release, had a massive impact on the industry, and while it hasn't aged gracefully in terms of actual gameplay, still holds a special place in my heart as a gorgeous piece of animation. Imagine that you're a teenager in the year 1983. You've just walked into your local arcade, a popular hangout that you've frequented so many times that you've become familiar with every single arcade cabinet that they have. You've played Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, Asteroids, and Galaga countless times. Maybe your initials sit atop the high score list on a few of these machines. You've got a pocket full of quarters, and you're wondering how you're going to spend the rest of your evening. When, suddenly, you notice a new machine in the arcade. Smack between Space Invaders and Centipede, there's an arcade game that looks like nothing you've ever seen before. As you approach the machine, the attract screen starts up, and your teenage mind is blown. Dragon's Lair, the fantasy adventure where you become a valiant knight on a quest to rescue the fair princess from the clutches of an evil dragon. 
You control the actions of a daring adventurer finding his way through the castle of a dark wizard who has enchanted it with treacherous monsters and obstacles. In the mysterious caverns below the castle, your odyssey continues against the awesome forces that oppose your efforts to reach the dragon slayer. Lead on, adventurer. Your quest awaits. For some, it's pretty hard to imagine the very first video game that you ever played. In my memory, it's that classic 3D pinball game, this battle tanks game, or Minesweeper, all on my old Windows family computer before the year I woke up on Christmas morning and shot a Velociraptor in Turok Evolution on the PlayStation 2. While it's difficult for me to pinpoint the exact very first video game that I ever played, it's very easy for me to remember the very first game that I ever obsessed over. But before I go into detail about my personal history with Dragon's Lair, I want to talk about the history of the game itself and approach that topic a little differently than I normally would on this channel. Obviously, I didn't grow up in the 1980s. When I discuss media that came out before I even existed, I usually rely on research from books, articles, or interviews from those who were actually there. I can easily look up information on Dragon's Lair, but at best, what I would be doing is trying to explain to you how big of a deal something was that I wasn't even around to see when it came out. Part of the reason that I feel so passionately about Dragon's Lair is I share that passion with the very person who introduced me to it. Someone who was there in 1983 when Dragon's Lair burst onto the scene. Someone who has a first-hand account of what it was like to play it on the original hardware. Someone who beat this infamously difficult game in the arcade at great expense. So, throughout this video, in addition to the usual research that I do for topics like this, I thought it would be cool for you to hear just how big of a deal Dragon's Lair was from someone who was there. My dad. So, dad. What was it like playing it back then? You remember the first time you played it or the first time you saw it? Yeah, I remember the first time I saw it. You have to remember that this was in the 80s, early 80s. Up until Dragon's Lair came out, all the games kind of looked the same. You had Pac-Man, Asteroids, Donkey Kong, Centipede. They had a race car too. It was kind of like a capital letter I that you drove around the track. And they had a gas pedal and a brake and you could push on them. So everything kind of looked like that. And so back in the 80s, if you were a teenager, you went and hung out in game rooms. And before that, you went and hung out in skating rinks. And they had pinball machines. That's what gaming was back then. Your home console that you were playing were nothing like what they had in the big game rooms that you would go to. So as a teenager, you wanted to hang out with kids your age, so you hung out in game rooms. I would play Asteroids or do the race car thing or something like that. Didn't take long to get bored with it. And so when Dragon's Lair came out, only the big game rooms had a copy of the Dragon's Lair, the big console game. That game was, it was the difference between using a flip phone and an iPhone yeah. when Dragon's Lair came out because it was, it had all this movement, it looked like a cartoon, and it didn't look like any other game. So it was real popular when it came out, and that was everybody's favorite game because it didn't look like all these other games. He is right about there not being anything like Dragon's Lair at the time. Everything from its presentation to its hardware were very new to arcades. Developed by Advanced Microcomputer Systems and published by Cinematronics, Dragon's Lair was the brainchild of Rick Dyer, who was inspired by the text-based game Colossal Cave Adventure. Advanced Microcomputer Systems, later called RDI Video Systems, would create a cabinet nicknamed the Fantasy Machine, which would run off of Laserdisc technology. In order to create what was described as an interactive movie experience. If you don't know what a Laserdisc is, here you go. It looks like a giant DVD, but is actually not entirely digital. It competed in the analog home video market against VHS and Betamax, and while it was actually superior in both video and audio quality than its competitors, it was ultimately just too expensive. 
While researching this video, I was surprised to learn that Laserdisc players were still being made until 2009. While this frisbee is certainly outdated now, it was a game changer back in the 80s. Especially if you compare other machines' pixel and vector graphics to Laserdisc's potential for full-blown interactive cell animation. Rick Dyer saw that potential, and after also seeing The Secret of Nim, he knew just the people to call to take his idea to the next level. Just in case you're wondering, this this isn't Dragon's Lair. It would be pretty cool to own the original laser discs for that. But no, uh, this is actually Mrs. Doubtfire. I own Mrs. Doubtfire on laser disc. I don't even have a laser disc player. I just have this movie. Rick Dyer would approach animation legends Don Bluth and Gary Goldman, who I've talked about a few times on this channel before. Their work has had a huge impact on me, and Dragon's Lair was my introduction to their style, as I'm sure it was for many back in the 80s. The entire budget for the game was about $3 million, which was pretty limited. They couldn't afford to hire live-action reference models, which is something that Bluth prefers when animating humans. So Dirk's original design had to be drastically altered from what Bluth originally described as a large hulking knight to something easier to animate. For Princess Daphne's design, they referenced photos of Playboy models. The game features a single hired voice actor, Michael Rye, who provided the voice heard in the attract screen. Dirk and Daphne were voiced by members of the staff. Film editor Dan Molina, who has credits on several notable films, provided the voice of Dirk. Daphne was voiced by Vera Landfer, who was the head of the animation cleanup department at the studio. Dragon's Lair was completed in seven months and debuted in arcades on June 19th, 1983. And to say that it was popular would be an understatement. When you first got there, somebody was playing the game, and there was usually a line behind them of people who wanted to play. That's the game everybody wanted to play. And, uh, and even if you weren't playing, you were watching somebody playing it, and that was just as entertaining. If I ever been hooked on a game, it was that one. Was Dragon's Lair a success? Well, let me ask you this. Was Moby Dick a white whale? Visiting an arcade in LA the first weekend to see the audience reaction, I was staggered to see a line of kids lined up around the block waiting their turn to play Dragon's Lair. Each lucky player walked up to a red carpet to the console, where red velvet ropes on either side held back the crowds. Above the player, the game was projected onto a large screen so everyone could watch Dirk saving Daphne or getting killed in nefarious ways. The reason for its massive popularity is pretty obvious. As my dad said, it was like you'd seen the future of gaming. When Dragon's Lair came out, it looked completely different. It had movement like you'd never seen, and, and sound like you'd never seen. Up until then, it was, you know, you were shooting something or driving something around and, and that sort of thing. And this had background music and sound effects, you know, for the swords, and the characters were talking and making grunt sounds and all this kind of thing. There are two ways that I'm going to approach talking about Dragon's Lair. The first is discussing it as a piece of animation. If you remove the game aspect from it, Dragon's Lair is one of the most gorgeously animated short films that I've ever seen. Even on their limited time and budget, Bluth and Goldman's team really went all out on the character designs, the colors, and the environments. Dragon's Lair follows Dirk the Daring, a knight who enters an enchanted castle to rescue Princess Daphne from the dragon that has kidnapped her. It's about as simple of a medieval fantasy narrative as you can get, and that adds to its charm. One of the things that always brings me back to Dragon's Lair is its perfectly campy tone. For lack of a better term, it takes the classic heroic knight's tale and makes it cartoony. Daphne is about as one note as you can get, with her dialogue throughout most of the game just being And when you do eventually get to the titular Dragon's Lair, she acts all ditzy and smiley, like there's really not much for her to be concerned about. The cage is locked with a key. By Bluth's own admission, Daphne acts as a goal for the players, and understanding the usual demographic that frequented arcades in the 80s, the floating Playboy Playmate made the most sense to him. <laughs> She also acts as one of the greatest distractions in all of gaming. I imagine several players, after spending all of their hard-earned quarters to get to the final scene of the game, immediately perished upon sight of Daphne. While the camera lingers on her, I'm sure many young players forgot about the game for a few seconds. I know I did. To get to Daphne, Dirk the Daring has to endure a massive castle with all kinds of different threats in each room. 
I absolutely love the idea of an enchanted castle whose interior seems to defy all logic. Sometimes you're in dungeons, corridors, crypts, and armories that you'd expect to be in a medieval castle, then suddenly you're in a chamber with giant multicolored balls, a hellish landscape with blob men that emerge from acid pits, swinging from burning ropes above a lake of fire, or careening down rapids in a rowboat. The castle is unpredictable, and seems to go on forever. There's a repeated scene where Dirk has to leap from this falling platform and enter another room. While he falls, you really get a sense of just how massive this place is. Each room contains an entirely new threat, if you ignore the fact that some rooms repeat because of the limited budget. And those threats, in typical Bluth style, range from truly horrifying to absolutely silly. Giant snakes, giggling skulls, hooded reapers, cackling horsemen, and living stone gargoyles. Some of these creatures are really intimidating, but then you get to the area with the lizard guy trying to bonk Dirk on the head or whatever the hell these things are that make monkey noises for some reason. No matter what enemy he may be facing or deadly trial he's trying to overcome, Dirk the Daring has the same reaction to each and every single one of them. The only appropriate reaction. In my opinion, Dan Molina as the voice of Dirk the Daring is the secret weapon of Dragon Slayer, the element that made me fall in love with this animation. He's a complete goofball, and I love him. Dirk is representative of what Dragon's Lair is. It's a classic story with a tongue-in-cheek, almost satirical edge to it. It's honestly kind of refreshing to see a knight get realistically freaked out when a laughing maniac on horseback rides toward him swinging a sword. Another thing that makes Dirk so endearing is that when he does win, he's a little arrogant about it. He'll struggle through a challenge and then act like it was no big deal. He's a very reactive character, one that's just as surprised as the player is when he figures out the gimmick of the level. As a matter of fact, one of the noises Dirk makes has become a bit of an in-joke for me and my dad, one that has endured since I was about seven years old. There's a noise that a character makes in the game. I don't know if you remember what that noise is, what? when it's the knight tapping the floor yeah. and Dirk is jumping. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> God bless Dan Molina, man. These screams, whimpers, and cocky giggles made Dirk one of my favorite characters in gaming. Yeah, he's not much of a character, only saying two actual lines of dialogue in the entire game, but he's just so fun to watch win by the skin of his teeth, and however morbid this may be, he's even more fun to watch die. Over and over and over again. The good thing about Dragon's Lair is it's really fun to watch him die, though. There's something funny about it. Yeah. There's more animation of him dying than there is of him succeeding yeah. in the game. <laughs> Once again, the genius of the Bluth Goldman style is applied to Dirk's many different defeats. Sometimes it is utterly horrific and a little too real, and other times it's wily coyote levels of silly and I wouldn't have it any other way. These are the screens that most fans remember the most. It's the insult to the injury. You and your buddies are in the arcade having to watch this poor guy get ripped apart, crushed, stabbed, bonked, or fried because you weren't quick enough to move him out of the way. And I remember feeling so conflicted about these screens as a kid. At first, they were really funny because I was watching a goofy cartoon character get hurt. But the more you play the game, the more you feel like it's getting disappointed with you. Just look at Dirk's face when you get a game over. He's like, dude, really? Not to mention how the music makes you feel like a complete idiot. Speaking of the music, the audio department absolutely knocked it out of the park here. Again, compare Dragon's Lair to other games at the time, and it's no contest. It's rarely quiet, with each level having a unique soundscape. The Laserdisc allowed for composer Chris Stone and recording engineers Brian Rusenko and Glenn Berkowitz 
to go all out with the synthesized strings. It's thrilling to see Dirk enter a room and be greeted by the dramatic musical strings that, granted, are pretty over the top, but fit the tone of the animation insanely well. Looking at it as an animated short film, Dragon's Lair is everything that I wanted as a young medieval fantasy nerd. Give me a campy story that doesn't take itself too seriously about a knight that rescues a princess after killing a dragon with a magic sword, and I'm happy. It's exciting, it's funny, it's charming, and it was led by two of the most legendary animators in the business. On the Steam version of Dragon's Lair, there's actually an option to just watch the game. You can even toggle on and off the death screens if you want. This is how I got most of the footage you've seen in this video so far, and this is, in my opinion, the best way to experience and appreciate Dragon's Lair. Because there's another side of this story that I haven't told yet. Another angle to approach Dragon's Lair. To look at it critically as a video game. So let's actually talk about how you play Dragon's Lair. It was 50 cents you'd put in there and you got three lives and you would play it and eventually you'd die because screens would come up that you'd never seen. Your timing was everything, is where you'd move or whether or not you'd pull the sword. It would take you a couple of screens of doing that before you learned how to not die and get through that yeah. screen. Like the man said, Dragon's Lair is essentially one long quick time event. In the words of Don Bluth, you don't actually control Dirk, you control his reflexes, and you yourself had better have some pretty insane reflexes. Those of you who haven't played Dragon's Lair are probably thinking, what, it's just a QTE, it shouldn't be that hard, just input the right buttons that it tells you to input. That would be true if Dragon's Lair actually told you what to input. You see, the original arcade version of Dragon's Lair, as well as the version that I played on the family PC as a kid, offered no button prompts whatsoever. You simply had to look at the screen and guess which option worked best for the given scenario. You go left, right, up or down, or use the sword. In some cases, it's pretty straightforward what you're supposed to do. Obviously, go left here, go right here, and Dirk drew his sword in the animation, so press the sword button at the right time, and you succeed. In some scenarios, the game even outright tells you where to go by having an entrance or item flash in the direction you should input. However, sometimes, I'd actually argue most of the time, you will die for three reasons. It's difficult to tell which input works for a given scene. For example, there's a door and a stairwell here. Both are on the right side of the screen. In the heat of the moment, I press right, only for right to send Dirk to his death. You're actually supposed to input up, as the door is where you're supposed to go, but it's further in the background. There are several scenarios like this, and the game tries its best to give you hints through enemy placement and environmental hazards to point you in the right direction. But you've got to think about it, and that leads to the second common cause of death in Dragon's Lair, the reaction time. I swear that I am not exaggerating when I tell you that in some scenes, you have about a nanosecond to react to what's happening on screen before you die. You'd think this would be resolved with memorization. If you've died on a level enough times, you figure out which input is correct, so you just spam that input early until it succeeds. That's why in some of this gameplay footage I recorded, you can hear these annoying beeps. Well, this only works sometimes. The version that I played for this video that sold on Steam is entirely random in determining when you can and can't spam an input. Sometimes you're allowed to, other times you're doing an input too early results in an instant death. There was even one instance that I recorded where I accidentally put in the wrong direction and the game didn't instantly kill me, so I was actually able to change it. The rules are entirely random for what counts and what doesn't, which can be pretty frustrating. What's even more frustrating than that is when Dragon's Lair decides to outright trick the player. Dragon's Lair is a game that lies to you. Like I said earlier, sometimes the game will have certain areas or objects glow to indicate where you're supposed to go. 
Once you get used to that, the game suddenly throws options at you. There's an item you can drink that glows, but instantly kills you. There's a chain that you can pull that results in you getting swept away by water. And there's an item that Dirk stops to look at that you're meant to ignore entirely or he'll fall to his death. In the original arcade version of the game, you've got three lives to work with. The game costs 50 cents to play, which at the time was insanely expensive for an arcade game. As a matter of fact, Dragon's Lair was the first ever arcade game to cost 50 cents to play. I looked back at my footage and counted up how many times I died. In 1983, this game would have cost me $9.50 to beat, and adjusted for inflation, that's almost $30. If you weren't playing the game, you would try to sit there and watch the screens that you weren't familiar with and see how that guy died or see how he got through the screen. And try to figure and out. That's, yeah, and save you money. You'd let that man burn all his quarters dying and you'd try to figure out how to get through the screens that you'd never seen before. With the limited budget that they had, the animators were able to stretch about 15 minutes of total animation to 30 minutes by just flipping some scenes horizontally which again added to some of the frustration, as you got used to how a level was set up, only to have to flip your movements that you'd memorized. Also, if you're playing the game in the original arcade version, you don't respawn in the same level that you died. Each death results in a different area, so the entire game is just memorization. Now, yeah, you didn't start where you left off. The screens would come up in different sequences, and once you thought you had a screen figured out and the screen would come up again, you thought, well, I got this, but it's now it's reverse. And so instead of jumping that way, you'd have to jump this way. And so eventually the clues, you know, when the screen would pop up, you'd know after doing it a couple of times, which way you were going to have to jump. Right. But that was part of it. Not just, you know, spending the money to finally get through all the screens, but this was your activity much like yours is now. You come home, you know, I mean, I have my kids play games for hours. Well, that's what you would do here. You'd go there and it wasn't just the gaming. This is what you were doing with your time. This is how you hung out with your friends mm -hmm. and do it and talk about the game and all that. So the game experience took longer. And so you were like getting more value for your money because right. it took longer to complete. You can kind of tell when you're getting close to beating the game, because in order to get to the final scene, you have to beat every scenario, and you'll start repeating the same screens until you finally get to the titular dragon's lair. I really like the design of the lair, it clearly being a reference to the lair of the dragon Smog from Tolkien's The Hobbit, with the dragon sleeping surrounded by his hoard of gold and treasures. As annoying as playing through this game can be, I can't deny that it's incredibly exhilarating to make it to the final stage. Plunging the magic sword into the dragon accompanied by that victorious music is incredibly satisfying the first time you get it, and I'll never forget when I first did it at 7 years old. If you're one of those who grew up in the 80s, finally made it to the Dragon's Lair, and were ultimately distracted by Daphne, losing your last quarters on the last prompt before you slay the dragon, my heart goes out to you. We've got the benefit of unlimited continues, but those before us didn't. So eventually, I don't, I don't know, after spending 500 or or $1,000, I finally learned how to get to the very last screen and you you beat dragon's lair i Vegas. finally beat it yeah yeah at at great expense i finally did to slay the dragon use the magic sword <laughs> In conclusion, Dragon's Lair isn't really a good game. There's not a huge reason why you should revisit the game after beating it once, and I can't really justify spending $10 on the Steam version unless you're a diehard fan like me or my dad. 
I know that I've compared it to other games of the time, and while it's obviously visually superior to everything else in the game room, there's a reason why so many return to Pac-Man or Donkey Kong over Dragon's Lair. Space Invaders may not be as graphically impressive as Dragon's Lair, but it does have actual control. There is a greater sense of player control for all of the other arcade classics of the era. But there's also a reason why it was one of only three video games to be preserved at the Smithsonian Institution. Dragon's Lair dared to try something new, something way ahead of its time. It wanted to take players on a cinematic grand adventure that it may not have been entirely capable of doing with its limited hardware, but it was a window into what games would become. Without Pong, Pac-Man, and Dragon's Lair, we wouldn't have what we're spoiled with today. Take your pick. Any of the landmark games of today with stories that make us cry, gameplay that makes us feel like badasses, and visuals that look almost like we're controlling real life are all built upon innovations that came from these three games that the Smithsonian and several other developers have recognized. Dragon's Lair had several home versions that couldn't quite live up to what it was able to do, some entirely changing the gameplay and graphical style to meet hardware limitations, and others poorly emulating the arcade machine. Dragon's Lair had the dream of being able to control a cartoon character, to actually play an animation, and with the breakthroughs in game developments over the years, we now actually can. Whether it's Hollow Knight's beautifully drawn digital 2D animation style, or Cuphead, which harkens back to the cell animated style and even challenges Dragon's Lair's notorious difficulty. You can purchase Dragon's Lair on Steam right now to try it out for yourself. There are several extras in the game for fans like myself, including interviews with Bluth, Goldman, and Dyer, a tutorial on how to draw Dirk, and the aforementioned mode where you can just watch the game. Also, this version does include a mode that tells you what to input, but I'd better not find out that you played this version. If you decide to buy this game, it is required that you play Dragon Slayer with no help whatsoever. You will suffer the way that I suffered and my father suffered before me. Yeah, I know you uh, You became a real big gamer after Dragon Slayer. You play a lot of games nowadays. <laughs> I don't play any games now. <laughs> I, you don't think I could get you in any game now at all? You don't think there's any game I could I could put on? I, so far, nothing I've seen. Maybe some of these that I see y'all playing now are, you know, of course, they smoke Dragon's Lair and you can play them at home. But back then, you had to drive somewhere right. to see the latest thing. That's the difference between the first iPhone and the last iPhone. You can play with your friends, even if they're in another country, you can play at the same time. That was something that was unheard of even 20 years ago. You wouldn't be able to do that. I mean, I've watched it go from Pac-Man all the way to what you just said. People playing online with people you never met or your friends, you know, who could be somewhere else. And it's, I mean, the gaming has changed from Atari, which I had the first one of, mm -hmm. and you would play Pong, and that was, that was the first one up until, you know, the kids now play and they don't even have to go to the store to buy it. I'll give my son my card and he'll go up there and buy whatever game he wants. He don't have to leave the house. So that, that's a huge leap from Pong. You don't know what's going to happen next. It'll make you jump if you do something wrong. It's like, no, exciting. It took me at least $40 before, you know, I killed the dragon. And I think it's about the best game I've ever played. Dragon's Lair is an important piece of animation history and gaming history. It was a massive success in the arcades, and it led to the development of more games by the same team like Space Ace a year later in 1984, and an official sequel, Dragon's Lair 2 Time Warp in 1991. I've never played Space Ace or Dragon's Lair 2, so if you want to see me cover those in a future video, let me know in the comments. Outside of the games, there was an animated series that aired in 1984 that didn't have any real involvement with Bluth or Goldman, and only lasted 13 episodes. Bluth and Goldman attempted to make a traditionally animated Dragon Slayer feature film, securing the funds through crowdfunding, but unfortunately it seems like this didn't really go anywhere. In 2020, Bluth and Netflix reached a deal to produce a live-action Dragon Slayer film starring Ryan Reynolds as Dirk the Daring. Yeah, 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 no, no. 
I'm glad Bluth is involved in everything, but this really should be an animated film. I don't see a reason why it needed to be pitched as a live-action movie in order to finally be made. And I don't know how you could capture that in live action. Yeah, I no, I think it'd be better as a cartoon or animation. Uh, it would for me anyway, because that's more of the flavor of what the game was. Dragon's Lair is special to me. My dad brought home a PC version of the game in the early 2000s, beat the game in front of me and my brother, and then left me to form my first ever obsessive need to beat a video game. It was punishing, it was funny, it was exciting, and it has a special place in my heart. It's the one video game that my dad and I have ever connected over, as he's not really that big of a fan of the medium, and I'm so happy that he was cool enough to sit down and talk about it for a while with me for this video. Well, even back then, I knew that it was going to change. Games were going to have to step up uh, if they were going to compete with it. You still had Pac-Man tournaments and pool tables and foosball and pinball and all that, but when Dragon's Lair come out, you knew that asteroids wasn't going to exist very long. Black and white blobs floating around, you shoot them, and that's the end of it. Yeah. Dragon's Lair was entertainment as much as it was playing. That's why if you weren't playing it, you'd stand there and watch the guy in front of you do it because it was like watching an a animated cartoon, you know, a movie. I knew games were going to have to step up if they were going to stick around after Dragon's Lair came out. And the guy that did Dragon's Lair did, this, uh, did the movie Anastasia, which was a bigger video on my channel. Um, in that video, I made a joke in the first few minutes of it uh, at your expense. And uh, I just want to ask on camera, mm -hmm. for the record, uh, 68 degree weather. What are your thoughts on that? It's too cold. <laughs> you think 68 degrees Fahrenheit, too cold? Yep. What is, what is the appropriate weather? 80. 80? 80 and up? Yeah. I like cold weather. Mm -hmm. They thought it was me. I'm quoting you yeah. in that. And in a weird way, you had like some popularity in my comments for a little while. Is that right? <laughs> Being like, you know, I agree with him or I don't agree. He's crazy. Yeah. Well, so, some people agree with me. <laughs> the people that agree. Yep. Thanks again to Dad for being in this video and thank all of you for watching this video. If you have any suggestions of things you want to see me cover next, you can leave them down in the comments below or you can hop on over to my Patreon where you can sign up to join my Discord. If you join the Patreon, you'll also get access to exclusive content, early access to videos, and all that good stuff, so please go check that out if you can. Subscribe to the channel, check out my other videos on animation like Anastasia if you're as big of a Bluth fan as I am, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. Thanks for talking with me Yeah, and, and deciding to be in one of my videos. Do you have anything you want to say to the people? Um, support the channel. How about that? That'll work. And play Dragon's Lair.